The definition of faith. Do you know, I mean, you go to the Bible and look up, I mean, to the dictionary and look up faith, but let's just go to the Bible. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 uh, gives us the, the definition, the biblical definition of uh, faith. Hebrews 11 verse 1. If you get there, say amen. I just threw that in there because I think you're used to that. <laughs> Hebrews 11, 1. The Bible says, and I'm reading from the, the New King James, now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Confidence and assurance. King James says, uh, uses the word substance. Faith is the substance of what we hope for and the evidence of what we do not see. Now, those are concrete terms. Th those, are, those are absolute terms. Faith is the substance. What, what is with substance? It's, it's, it's something real, something you can grab a hold of. Evidence, as if you were there. As if you were there. Faith. So, what is the... The, the scenario, and we can put it in the context of the plan of salvation, the what happened, what was the consequences, what was the rescue plan, what must I do, and how much do I contribute to the plan. I want to read in fairly quick succession a few uh, Bible verses. There's going to be five points here that reveal uh, the, the, the why of the plan of salvation and uh, where you come in and what, what God did to to formulate the plan of salvation. Revelation 12, 7 through 9. Revelation 12, 7 through 9. The Bible says, Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough. And they lost their place with them to sin the first sin. And they ate of the tree of the midst of the garden that they were not supposed to eat. In Genesis 3, verse 12 and 13, God questions what happened. The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. Then the Lord said to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me. The serpent deceived me and I ate. The war that happened in heaven happened because this enemy of God told lies about God. He contradicted truth. And he comes to this earth and he does the same thing with the first couple. And he deceives them. He lies about God and causes them to sin. And that sin becomes a choice. Whom will you serve? And all mankind follows. Turn with me to Romans chapter 5. The next uh, two verses are in Romans. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. The Bible says, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, in this way death came to all people, because all sinned. What was the consequences of this first sin. Death. To all mankind. Because that first choice in the garden. Because of that deception. They chose the lie over the truth. Now God needs to do something about it. Romans 5 verse 19. Same chapter. Isn't it interesting? Did you all read my notes before you did the children's story and stuff? No. The <laughs> plan of salvation. <clears throat> Chapter 5, verse 19, for just as through the disobedience of one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of one man, the many will be made righteous. The plan of salvation, the plan of salvation, his perfection is granted to you, and he takes your sinfulness. On himself. The ending Bible verse, repeat it with me, John 3 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Whosoever believeth in him. And I'm going to connect that word believe 
with faith. Whosoever believeth in him sounds too simple to be true. Sounds too simple to be true that you can be rescued from certain death by simply believing. That that's it. That's just that simple. Is faith, I want to ask you a question, is faith believe? Whosoever believeth shall not perish. Is faith a moment in time where you responded to a preacher's call and you came to the front of a church and your lips moved and you said, I believe. Is that all that constitutes faith? Is it lip service? Does saying I do believe satisfy whoever believes will not perish? You know, what I just read to you, what happened? Up in heaven there's a war. Satan was cast out. He deceived mankind. Mankind sinned. The consequences was death to all men. God formulated a plan. He gave his son. His son took our place. He died on the cross. And if we believe and have faith, we can be saved. It's easy to believe all those things. We've read many many times. Back then when Christ was crucified, when he was on this earth, the thing that the the Israelites had, or the Jews had trouble believing was, is this the Messiah? And I think for most Christians now, we look back and we think the things I just read to you from the war in heaven and the Satan being cast out, him being a deceiver, the first sin that caused death in the rescue plan, that's, that's easy for us to accept and say, I believe. What I think sometimes we struggle with, I looked at the statistics. Right now on the earth, there are over 8 billion people living on this earth. Eight billion. And I couldn't find, I actually looked to see if there was somebody's uh, in a creationist theological mindset, how many people do you think were living uh, from the beginning of creation? So if there's eight billion today, I don't know, Mark, I mean, how many would that be since the beginning of time? And you're telling me that out of, I mean, I'll just throw a number out there. Can, can we, who knows? 40 billion, I don't know how many people have been alive since the beginning of time. It's a big number. And you think God was thinking about you personally when he formulated the plan of salvation? You think he was thinking about just you? Maybe that's a little bit harder to believe. The Bible says, before you were formed in your mother's womb, I knew you. When I consider the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? Who am I, God, to you, and do you really love me to the point that you would have done what you did if it was only me? How intimately does God want to be with you? You've all read the story of the parable of the lost sheep. One of my favorite pictures uh, pops up on Facebook quite a lot right now, and uh, I'd love to order the picture. Um, I'd show it to you, but I don't know if I'd be violating copyright uh, laws by showing it to you. But it shows a lamb kind of like in a mud puddle in the woods in the distance coming out of the fogginess of the woods is Jesus running. Okay? And, And the parable says that he left how many behind? 99 to go find the one. Would it be appropriate to say that he left 8 billion behind to come find just you? Can we get that personal? How does God feel about you? I'm going to show you a picture. I'm going to show you a picture of my daughter. Now, we have a granddaughter now, and and she's, what, 13, going on 14 months old? I want you to look at this picture and look at Julia's face. 
And imagine that this is God holding you, just you, okay? And, and I hope it has an impact on you like it did me. Um, this happened about a year ago. So Paisley, you'll see Paisley is, is very small. Uh, I drove the SVA bus to Tennessee for the soccer tournament, which is where they're, they just they just finished that up yesterday. And Julia was standing there. She came to visit me because it's just north of uh, uh, Collegedale. And I saw her holding Paisley, and she didn't even know I took the picture. And I looked at that picture and immediately thought about the Bible verse I'm going to read to you afterwards. And I said to myself, with a lot of emotion, I said, God, do you really think about me the way God's face, Julia's face, is portraying Look at Julia's face and tell me what you think she's thinking and feeling. Look at her face. I got emotional when I saw that after I took the picture. And I literally had a prayer the first time I looked. I mean, I looked at it right down on my phone seconds after I took it and said, God, is this how you feel about me? What do you think his answer is? I'm such a softy. This is crazy. <laughs> Somebody have a tissue? <laughs> this is... Do you get it? Do you get it? And this is the Bible text I thought when I saw that. Isaiah 49, 15 through 16, can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, I will not forget you. See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hand. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> Isaiah 54, 5 uh, refers to uh, Jesus as your husband. Your maker is your husband. And because of this, because of what God feels about you, because of his reference to him being your husband, I'm telling you that my understanding is that faith must be lived. There must be living, practicing evidence of your faith in your life. My faith statement must be more than a verbal I do. God is my husband. It is a living, reciprocal love relationship. If my relationship with God is like marriage, what is the commitment level that God expects? Matthew 10, 37 says, Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. That is powerful. That is powerful. That is how, number one, God wants to be with you because that's how, number one, you are to him. <clears throat> I looked up if, if, if our relationship with God is, is similar to being married, and he said so. I looked up the top reasons for divorce. Just Google it, top reasons for divorce. And there's a bunch of things that pop up, but the first one that popped up gave four reasons, and here are two of the four reasons listed. Top reasons for divorce, lack of commitment, and lack of communication. Lack of commitment and lack of communication. And so if I titled my sermon, Knowing God Through Prayer, or Your Prayer Life Reveals Your Faith Quotient, How is it with you and Jesus today? How is it with you and Jesus today? I want to share a parable with you uh, very quickly. Matthew chapter 25. Um, the parable of the ten virgins. It's about marriage. Um, let me just read real quickly to it, and then I'll just make, make a point. And we, we kind of dissected this really well at the church camp out a couple weeks ago. It says, At that time the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. 
The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. No, they replied, There may not be enough for both of us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later the others also came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly, I tell you, I don't know you. The saddest words recorded in the entire Bible, the bridegroom saying, I don't know you. I don't know you. All ten of these virgins, the wise and the foolish, were aware. They were in the church. They attended the same church. They had the same Bible. They believed the same truth. But what was missing? What was missing? The oil represents the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit in the vessel, you're the vessel, interpreted knowing God, must be deeper than lip service. The foolish virgins had the lip service. They said, I do, because it says they came and said, Lord, Lord. So sometime in their life, maybe many times in their life, they did the lip service. Saying, I believe, is not enough. Saying the words I believe does not interpret to faith. So I want to explore one aspect of your Christian life. One aspect that interprets or emphasizes, gives the evidence of the faith that is in you. And that's your prayer life. If your prayer life is the defining factor in the question, how is it with me in Christ today, what is your answer? Does my prayer life confirm that I know God? Am I living my faith through my prayer life and my communication with God? See, faith believes that I contribute absolutely nothing to the plan of salvation. Faith believes that God supplies everything. The Bible says, uh, many teenagers pick this as their favorite Bible verse, and, and maybe you do too. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But God also flips that verse around in John 15.5, which says, I can do nothing, absolutely nothing without him. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And we like to quote that scripture whenever a bad thing happens to us. When something Severe challenges us in life. But what about the simple things in life? You're educated to do your job. Do you need to pray about that because you've got X number of years of experience and you've got a diploma on the wall that shows what you know and what you're good at, et cetera, et cetera, and I'm okay with this. I'll call on you, God, when something bad happens. The Bible says, Jesus says, you can do absolutely nothing without me. Because of this, faith motivates me to involve God in every aspect of, our, of my life. Whether it's a serious, devastating challenge of life that requires, requires God's involvement, or whether it's something so simple as buying your next car. And so we're going to share with you two testimonies of prayer. Answered prayer, and I ask Kedron to come up here. Kedron does not uh, enjoy being up front. And I have convinced her that um, I've convinced her that that if you have a, 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 an answered prayer or you have a test of praying, and those ten days of prayer ended on a Friday, and we offer let the church know that that Friday it would be an anointing service, and I didn't know that was going to do this. Go off. She asked to be anointed, anointed that night, and she told me about it uh, afterwards. And I knew she was having a struggle, and uh, 
Brother Mark and uh, Donna uh, performed the anointing for her as the rest of us prayed. And I don't even think you explained to them why you were being anointed. Did you? No, I was crying too much. <laughs> <laughs> she just, it, an emotional, um, just throwing herself out, out on the mercy seat. So, um, Kedron, would you please just tell the people about your work, where do you work, and, and uh, tell her about the, the, just what, what is your work? Um, I teach students with autism. I teach kids that um, are at the lowest level of autism. So my, my classroom is a level two autism class. So my students' IQs are 50 and below. So very, very tough kids um, in tough situations. So um, can you describe the, the type of kids that you, you teach? I mean, what, what is the prospect for them as they grow older, uh, their academic, the possible academic achievement, et cetera? This part always breaks my heart for my kids because when the last person that loves the child that I'm teaching, um, they will be in, a, in an institution or a group home where there's somebody there 24 hours a day. And what about behavior? Uh, how do they express themselves when they get upset? <laughs> they can be very violent sometimes. Um, my, I can simply just throw out the, hey, come to the table and let's do this. And a chair gets thrown or you, know, you get spit on, you get hit or bit or it, it's tough. Not, not all of them have that explosion, but the large majority of them do. Several times, many times, Kevin will call me during the day when she gets a chance to, to, to uh, have a minute of herself by herself. And the, the, I can remember one particular day about this time she, she called me. In the morning, it's before noon, and she says, I've already been hit 15 times. And when she says hit, uh, we're talking about hit hard enough that it leaves bruises. She gets spit, she gets uh, bit, uh, teeth marks, etc. cetera. Um, and so her whole job, uh, th there were days when she would come home and just collapse on the couch, and she said, I've had enough. I'm done. I don't even know why I'm here. I don't know why I'm here. And, and then she'll turn around and then start another conversation about how she just loves the kid and, and she go out with her own money and buy treats and keep it in her, her drawer just for a certain kid and just does whatever it takes to, to make things perfect. But during this time, uh, you know, her clientele is students, parents, uh, friends of the family, relatives, uh, other teachers, staff, etc. And if you walk past her room at just the right time or the wrong time, and you look into her room, she has a schedule on the on the wall. I've been in her classroom twice, and, and it, it goes in just minutes, few minute increments, maybe fifteen minute increments of what the plan for the day is. But a fire can start and totally demolish that uh, because now it's. Uh, Put out the fire and if she walked past her room at just the wrong time and looked in it's easy for an adult to look in and says what a mess that room is that teacher has lost total control and I think you can I can say that you had suffered criticism that made you question your effectiveness yes how did it affect your spiritual life it made me feel useless. I mean, it made me, made me question, you know, I didn't go back to school to do this till I was like 54. I already had a bachelor's degree in education for physical education and driver's education. And I'm like, why did I do this to myself? Why did I put myself back in debt just to get pounded every day and criticized every day? And those are kind of things I was trying to tell Mark and Donna, but I just I couldn't at that time get them out. But then there's these small 
we make these small strides and like, yep, this is this is why I'm here. This is this is what I'm going to do. Can you share with them? I, I would have asked the question: What are some measurements you use of progress with these kids? And you had an experience with one of the mothers that met you in a meeting. Uh, tell us what happened there. So most of my little guys cannot talk; they're nonverbal. Some of them can say a few sentences, or can do just you know individual words to get their stuff out. And this one little boy, I have been trying and trying to get him to use his voice and use his voice because not all of them can they just do not have the ability the disconnect is there but I in my opinion think if I can just help them talk communicate either by pictures or their voice or whatever you know then they can say hey I need this or I want this or whatever and this one little boy um I was just really pushing him to say mom, mama, Um, because M's are easier, M's and P's and L's and S's, those are easier for them to get out, and so we're working with mama. And so I had parent-teachers conference with his mama, and she all of a sudden burst into tears, and she said, I have waited six years to hear him say mama. And when he said, Mama, my heart was so full. And, you know, I'm sitting across the table with, you know, my professionalism <laughs> just bawling with her. So, you know, six years it took to get that mama out. So, You know, Ketterin had shared with me that when she decided to be anointed, uh, by the way, you don't have to be just anointed when you're physically sick because <laughs> uh, spiritual and, and physical draining uh, needs God's healing. But she, she couldn't verbalize to you guys what it was, she, and, and it was hard for her to verbalize it at, at, at all. And it was a, an act of just letting go of everything, letting go of everything and saying, God, you have to take control. And so what is interesting, <laughs> I learned this uh, after this had happened. I guess it was several weeks after that. We were having a small group uh, Bible study, and she blurted out, this testimony and this is the portion I didn't know at that time after that anointing service she of course we we pray every morning before we go off to work and and we've been doing that since before we were married we we will not leave the house unless we do that and that was going on through all of this Um, but her prayer life intensified because of that anointing and so it takes her about 40 minutes to drive to work and uh, there is a certain exit that she takes. She fell in love with a song that spoke to her, and I'm going to read you uh, verses out of that song. And she said she figured out that if she queued up this song uh, on her radio, that it would play through twice and finish up the second time as she's pulling into the parking lot. And so this is a song by Mercy Me, Say I Won't. Do you know the song? Today it all begins. I'm seeing my life for the very first time through a different lens. That was her because she let it all go. I'm going to run. No, I'm going to fly. I'm going to know what it means to live and not just be alive. The world's going to hear because I'm going to shout. And I, <laughs> I will be dancing when circumstances drown the music out. Because that's where she had been. Was you see what kind of much I am? You thought you were having a hard time. <laughs> <laughs> Not enough is what I've been told, and she felt that that she had been criticized and was questioning whether she was enough. Not enough is what I've been told, but it must be a lie, because the spirit inside says I'm so much more. So let them say what they want. Oh, I dare, I dare them to try. And the song ends with, and she says when she got to the, the ending of this song, she says, I was singing really loud with the windows up. And, and she can't sing. <laughs> she can't sing. Uh, but she sang this really, really loud. And it says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. So keep on saying I won't, and I'll keep proving you wrong. 
And I can imagine when <laughs> she was singing this, admitting that she admits that she can't sing, that God's in heaven, and he says, Gabriel, come here. you got to hear this. Because it was wonderful. <laughs> wow. That was a serious thing to pray about. I don't know what time it is. I'm going to end with this next story, but... Um, God is good. That was in all the time. God is good. So, faith, living faith, living faith, um, practiced through prayer. But what about the simple things in life? What about the simple things? Would you consider praying for days and days and weeks and weeks? For a simple thing like buying your next vehicle? Or is that just too simple and too easy that you don't need to involve God? Julia, when she was born, uh, we had a truck. That's the truck. That's the truck we had. And so this truck was um, my work truck. And you see the camper shell in the back? And that camper shell had a ladder rack that encompassed that camper shell. And that camper shell, or that, that camper shell and that rack only fit in that truck. <clears throat> and so in the back, I would keep all my tools. And the ladder rack would haul my ladders and stuff. And we would use that truck. Uh, at that time, uh, we were going to West Virginia quite often with uh, parents failing in health and sometimes every other weekend. And so the truck worked perfectly. Oh, I can see it back there. Worked perfectly with me driving, uh, Ketterin in the driver's, the passenger seat, and Julia in the car seat between us. We would take it, or we take a, a week's vacation every year to the beach. It's a four-wheel drive, it goes out on the beach. So this was our second family vehicle. And then when we were traveling to West Virginia, uh, we needed that because in the wintertime, you know, I needed the four-wheel drive. And so um, 17 months after Julia was born, Kirsten is arriving, our second daughter. You know why this truck's not going to work, right? It's a single cab. And so we prayed about replacing the truck. I love that truck absolutely gorgeous truck and and I know it's not the best of pictures it's a digital of a of an of an actual picture that I took but loved the truck I didn't want to get rid of it but it was something we needed to do and so we prayed and prayed for about buying a new truck and I looked at many many different options and one day I found myself on the the Dodge dealership lot in in Harrisonburg and uh, looking at a used vehicle and determined that that was not going to work and the salesman came out there and he says, well, what about this one? And he points to a brand new, uh, brand new Dodge three-quarter ton extended cab, eight-foot bed. Oh, nice truck. And I looked at it and I thought, no, there's, there's no way I can afford it. Uh, it's not, you know, things were tight. You know, we had one baby, another baby on the way. And, uh, and so he said, no, come in my office. Come in my office and sat down at his desk. And he crunched numbers and, and uh brought some banks up online, et cetera, and said, here's how you can afford it. Told me what my payments would be, et cetera. But there's one thing he wasn't considering. Um, it was a truck with just the bed. This camper shell would not fit on that Dodge. Number one, it was dark green. This is light blue. It wouldn't fit because the size configuration of the bed didn't match, you know. And my ladder rack wouldn't work. And so if I was going to use that green Dodge, I would have to buy another shell if I'm going to continue this way like that in a ladder rack. And I crunched the numbers in my head, and I, I just said, no, it's not going to work. And when I say we prayed about this, we're talking about weeks and weeks and weeks. It was a, a regular thing of prayer. It didn't need to be solved right then because Kirsten wasn't here yet. Kirsten was arriving January 27, right? So at the end of the year, before the end of the year, uh, we took off for Christmas uh, and went back to West Virginia to be with parents. And we're going to stay till after the new year. 
in the Dodge dealership called me. And he said, we're going to lower the price on this truck to where you're going to buy it uh, because we want to get rid of it before the last day of the year. And he did make it sweeter, and we talked about it, and I thought, but still, no, it's not right. But we got to do something. I've got a very pregnant Kedron, you know. She was born on the 27th, but she could have come any time back then, you know, had some health problems, and the doctor may have taken her before that. And so the decision was made we stood on the front of her mom and dad's porch and held hands and prayed. I'm going to leave her there in West Virginia. I'm going to go to Harrisonburg and I'm going to buy that truck. And I prayed. And I said, God, right now I'm going to go get that green Dodge. But I don't feel good about it. And I'm not convinced it's the right thing to do. If it's the wrong thing to do, stop me. <laughs> you ever pray like that? Stop me. So it's three hours and 15 minutes to home. I'm going to go to Harrisonburg. I'm going to get the truck, and I'm going to come back. Three, in a, three hours and 15 minutes to Harrisonburg. I leave her house. Early Sunday morning, guys, the fog is still lifting off the ground. Okay? I want to do this and, uh, you know, and, and get back. I leave and I drive 18 miles to the town of Buckhannon. And I take the exit of the town of Buckhannon and that's where we go into the mountains and up over mountains and stuff. And at the bottom of the ramp, on the right hand side, tucked in a little hole in the hill, is a little trailer used car lot with no more than five cars. The owner of that car lot decided he had some paperwork to do that morning. He was parking his truck as I'm coming down the ramp. He lifts the windshield wiper and puts a for sale sign under his personal truck. And I immediately started praying prayer of thanksgiving because that is the truck. It's only one year newer than the truck I have. That's the same topper. The bed is exactly the same. My ladder rack works. I sold the existing truck for most of what I paid for this one. And when I tell this story to people, some people in the world would say, what an awesome circumstance. It's just, just an accidental circumstance that happened. But what do you think? As they answer to prayer. And so within moments of me leaving the house and praying with Kendra and I came back to the house and she's like, what are you doing here? I said, we got to go together to pick, get, pick up a truck. And I bought that truck and then after I bought it, sold the one I had. Faith in action, faith lived out. That is the proof of the strength of your faith. You live it out in your life. Thank you.